Since the first Egyptian embarkations, sailboats have evolved over the millennia. But in the early 19th century, when the steamship threatened the maritime supremacy of the sailing vessel, the most magnificent commercial sailing ships of all time were built, the clipper ships. Unfortunately, at the beginning of the 20th century, these giants vanished from the sea. Now, a hundred years later, the Royal Clipper, the largest sailing vessel ever built, is reviving the tradition of its predecessors. Though it boasts all the modern technological devices, the Royal Clipper nonetheless is a true sailing vessel. It's inherited these four masts that cross the oceans, sometimes under Dantesque conditions, cast into the raging elements, decks swept by crashing waves, sailors clinging to the yard arms. These great ships with their square-rigged sails battled as bravely as the men. The Clippers have written some of the most beautiful pages of sailing history. New York to San Francisco via Cape Horn in the days of the California Gold Rush. The London to China Sprints for fresh Chinese tea. And finally, the transatlantic crossings, notably to the Caribbean. By the end of the 19th century, the steam-driven ship was triumphant. However, the industrialized nation still sought the lowest cost for transporting raw materials. So ships driven by the force of the wind and the courage of its sailors found a new niche. Thus, in 1902, the greatest of the clipper ships, the Preussen, was launched. When um, in the youth of Michael Kraft, who is the president of the company, it was his dream. Eh? Uh, and he used to see these uh, pictures of uh, Preussen. And he says, one day, he will build this ship. And that was his childhood dream. He, he knew uh, the ship by heart, in his mind. He knew exactly what he wanted. And uh, sometimes it was irritating. Eh? But uh, when you saw the result, it was always perfect. first winter season, the Royal Clipper plots a course for the West Indies. The caravels of Christopher Columbus, the galleons of the conquistadors, brigantines of the pirates and African slave ships. For 500 years, the Caribbean has evoked the wildest dreams, as well as the most horrendous nightmares. Today, the West Indies only hosts yachts and cruise ships, a destination for tourists craving to savor its exotic past. What memories remain of these 500 years of tormented history and what remains of the legacy of these sailing ships? To find out, the Royal Clipper will escort us from island to island in the Caribbean. Port of departure, Fort de France on Martinique. Because of its strategic position, Fort de France has been a major port for sailing ships coming from France since French colonization began in the 17th century. Until the mid-1800s, the frequency of arrivals and the time it took to make the transatlantic crossing remained fairly static. In the early 1800s, two types of vessels made transatlantic crossings. The traditional great clipper ships that carried merchandise and passengers and made the voyage in four to six weeks, and the English steamships or packet ships that began servicing the West Indies routes in the 1840s. 
They were able to make the trip in 16 or 17 days. To ensure France a direct connection with the French West Indies, Napoleon III commissioned the Perrier brothers to launch the General Transatlantic Company. In 1864, their first ocean liner was designed and built especially for this route. This cargo passenger ship was outfitted with the customary three masts and sails and named the Louisiana. Ships that sailed the West Indies were commonly called schooners, or goelettes by the French. And although there were several classes, the English referred to all of them as schooners, regardless of whether they carried two, three, or four masts. The Royal Clipper bids farewell to Fort de France. In the past, a crew of hundreds of sailors were needed to scale the yard arms on the four masts and set the sails. Okay, belay. The Royal Clipper has fewer than 20 crew members, but the many electrically operated windlasses allow the crew to unfurl 26 sails simultaneously. However, in case of a problem, the crew is trained to climb up the masts, as they did in the old days. These are experienced seamen. Many are from Russia, where the tradition of sailing is still taught in the naval academies. With its 42 sails billowed in the wind, the Royal Clipper cuts a course towards Barbados. Barbados is unique among the West Indies Islands. England was the first country to colonize it and remained its only ruler, hence its nickname, Little England. Barbados, with its modern port of facilities built in the 1960s, is one of the most popular ports of call in the West Indies. Removed from the hustle and bustle of the port and huge cruise ships, the very British Yacht Club is a quiet haven and very often the first stop for sailors crossing the Atlantic. We arrived two days ago, the night before last actually, from Indelo, Cape Verde, about 2,000 miles from here. We put into Barbados for supplies before heading for Tobago, Grenada and other islands. I have my whole family here, my wife and three kids are sailing with me. We stopped off in Cape Verde, but there's very little water available. We have everything we need here. It took us 13 days to make the voyage, but time passes quickly at sea. We were never bored. Because we are set to the east of the island chain, every boat almost coming across the Atlantic reaches Barbados and stops at Barbados before going anywhere else in the Caribbean. The, the prevailing winds are northeasterly. This is why uh, the boats, like birds as they say, sail south and then continue up the chain of the islands, up the eastern seaboard and use the westerlies to go back to Europe. The English chose Barbados as its flagship colony in the West Indies because of its strategic position. Bridgetown, the capital, became almost as important in the 17th century as London or Boston, as the world center of the sugarcane trade. To maintain its supremacy, the English needed manpower. Thus, a triangular trading arrangement was organized across the Atlantic. Slave ships either bought slaves along the African coast or traded cheap trinkets for them. 
After the slaves were sold to the plantation owners in Barbados, the ships would then fill their holes with tropical produce and sail to England to sell it. For centuries, the island of Barbados was a huge sugar plantation, and until the beginning of the 20th century, to transport the molasses or rum intended for export, local boats were used, the famous schooners. A hundred years ago, people were transported from the north of the island, um, a village known, or a small town known as Spitestown, to the capital town, Bridgetown. And this vessel here transported some 30 or 40 passengers on a daily basis, along with cargo such as sugar. It was, if you like, a sort of water taxi in those early days. And here we have one of the captains. It was a distance of about 18 kilometers, and it took one to two hours to complete the journey. Eventually, the sugarcane market declined, and as was the case in many other islands in the West Indies, tourism seemed to be the only viable alternative. The old dry dock port was considered a blight to the new hotels, shops, and parking projects, and was destroyed. Along with the port went the exciting ambiance that had surrounded the sailboats, cargo ships, and schooners lined along the wharf. Well, the, the most of the activities was done by schooners. The schooners brought the cargo in, they took the sugar and the molasses out to the big ships, and then we had uh, donkeys and mules, and the most of the activities were done by hand carts, people pushing carts, you know, taking the produce to the various places. Well, it was more manual. Time to say goodbye to Barbados and head back to the Royal Clipper where we'll be spending our first night on board. The Clippers of old were mostly outfitted for commercial use. The few passengers they carried had to make do with a minimum of comfort and space. Most of the space was allotted to the holes and merchandise. While the hull, masts and decks of the Pryson served as the architectural model for the ship, the imagination was given free reign in designing the interior. The result is astonishing. The subtle blending of mahogany and copper evokes the spirit of sailing ships of an earlier era. The open atrium soaring upwards for three decks illuminates the wide staircase with its wrought iron balustrade that leads to the restaurant and is reminiscent of the opulent ocean liners of the early 1900s. After an overnight 140 nautical mile sail, we're approaching the island of Grenada. The captain gives the command to lower the sails. In the olden days, you would have had to come along the wind, you can't sail into the wind. It would have been a different thing. You would have, uh, like, tacking into the place in, in this, this respect. And, and that may, it might have taken a whole day to get where we go into in, in one hour. It's quite simple at the moment. Just approach the place and uh, 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 we are doing the right speed. And for me, it's, of course, after years and years and years, I notice immediately whether everything is, 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 is okay. And, and deep or inside, I'm with the ship, I'm with the ship, so maybe 80% of my brains is working ship and 20% is answering your questions. <laughs> Port done. 
Yeah. Where do you want us to anchor there? Yeah. Okay. Port 20. Riding anchor off St. George, Grenada's capital. This city, with its red rooftops, has an amphitheater that spreads out along the hills overlooking the bay, the dry dock, and the port. It's one of the most beautiful moorings in the West Indies. At one time, French presence here was quite strong and existed well into the 18th century. What remains is the vestiges of fortifications and the old painted brick warehouses along the wharf, referred to as the French style dry dock. Grenada is called the Island of Spices, not just to attract tourists, for it really is the second largest producer of nutmeg in the world. Nutmegs, which is a major spice of Grenada, was introduced in around the mid-19th century. And from since then, it has been um, multiplied throughout the island. And, and I think it held roots in Grenada because of the mountainous uh, condition, the similarity of um, Grenadians um, topography to that of Indonesia, certain of the islands in, in Indonesia, that is in the East Indies. In this harbor here, you will find, of course, behind me, you will find uh, schooners. But for the export of nutmegs, we will traditionally have badges that will be taken to the outer port where it will be loaded on the larger ships for exports to the industrialized countries where the nuts will be used for, uh, as a blender in food processing. It was only, it was primarily the Europeans that use nutmegs. They saw it as an exotic uh, spice, very expensive, and used it, in fact, because it was so expensive, many, many Europeans became rich. Those who traded in nutmegs became very rich. Because this was, it was used for all kinds of medicinal and other products, you know? This deep water port accommodates cargo ships from all over the world that come here to take on precious merchandise. The southern part of the island around St. George is booming, thanks to tourism, while the rest of the island, notably the interior, is dependent upon spice farming. Goyav, a town about 25 miles north of St. George, is home to one of the largest cooperatives on the island. Each morning, the farmers bring their nutmegs here, still in their shells. There, in the gloom of the warehouse, the precious spice is sorted, then placed on long shelves, awaiting processing. Now the farmers will go early in the morning, collect the nutmeg, carry it into their homes where they will remove the mace from around the shell, place the mace in the sunlight for a couple of hours to extract the moisture, after which time the nutmeg is carried to this factory. On arrival, we have to do an examination, and this is to ensure that the farmers are bringing good quality nutmegs. The position of the nutmegs on the shelf indicates the date they were received. The shells are turned over once each day to speed the drying process. They will continue to dry along the shelves for several weeks until they're placed in sacks and stored on another floor of the factory. Attracted by the noise, we enter another world only a few yards away. Here we see, like the cross section of a giant anthill, the masters of the world above, continually feeding the hard working ants on the floor below. Thrown, sucked into the funnel of the mill, ground, the shells of the nutmegs are partially crushed, 
Then they land a few yards further down in the workshop. The workers deftly separate the nutmegs from their shells with amazing skill and speed, and sort them. Paid according to their output, they keep count by making a mark on the workshop wall for each sack they fill. It's painstaking work, and the pay is miserably low. So Wilson spends his days in the workshop selling lottery tickets. It's almost like he was selling dreams. There's a simple water test at the end of the production line to determine the quality of the nutmeg. The lightest ones, those that float, are intended for the pharmaceutical industry. The heavier ones sink to the bottom. They're sold as spice. Outside, Far from the din and gloom of the factory, Granada once again assumes its tropical beauty. Leaving Granada, the southernmost point of our cruise, we turn the ship toward St. Vincent, 60 nautical miles to the north. We're approaching St. Vincent, but the calm winds have thrown us off our schedule. The Royal Clipper must start its engine. Oleg, who's in charge of the sails, takes advantage of the lull in the wind to inspect one of the masts. Uh, in Russia, a lot of, lot of tall ships. It's a very good school, very good uh, sails, uh, tall ship school. Yeah. I'm working before on the biggest in the world, uh, Sido. No, this one is the biggest in the world. Uh, before cruising stand, also it's very nice, training ships, uh, Russian ships, uh, very nice. There's something broken here, yeah, I have to fix, I have to fix, I have to go up there, fix it, the ticket of the sails for the new one. But brand new, the ship is new, just uh, less work. But before it was a lot of work here. Yeah. And um, of course it's more interesting here yeah, than under any cargo ship, any cargo ship because a little bit romantic, romantic the, uh, the people change it, a lot of interesting people come here. here. The Royal Clipper drops anchor in a little cove called Indian Bay only a couple of miles from Kingstown, the capital of St. Vincent. Unlike its dependencies, the Grenadines, which attract yachtsmen year-round, tourism has barely made its mark on St. Vincent. Nothing has been done to upgrade the downtown streets near the port or the markets in order to lure tourists, which is rather the exception in the West Indies. But what the island lacks in tourist dollars, it recoups through farming and fishing.
Catholic or Anglican, the churchgoers of St. Vincent, like churchgoers almost everywhere in the Caribbean, prove that evangelism preached by the colonists found its mark. However, evangelistic activities here in St. Vincent failed. Until the mid-1700s, St. Vincent was Indian territory. More surprising still, a large number of escaped slaves, brown-skinned people, found refuge here, including the survivors of a slave ship that was shipwrecked nearby in 1695, en route to the island of Bakeway. Taken in by the Caribbean Indians, a new race of people called the Black Caribs, or Garifunas, arose. They successfully repulsed the English until 1763, when they were overrun and deported to the Honduran island of Rotan. The collection of paintings by William Linzel depicting this episode in the history of St. Vincent hangs in Fort Charlotte, overlooking Kingstown Bay. There are those who dispute the origin of the Garifunas. A story that has been handed down over generations describes an African population living on St. Vincent that preceded the arrival of the slaves by several hundred years. There were thousands of Negro and Negroid people who came across the Atlantic in the 13, early 1300s. They uh, were the followers of Abu Bakr, uh, who was the emperor of Mali at that time. And he got this uh, directive from an high, a vision that he was to come and explore beyond the boundaries of the Atlantic, which touched on uh, uh, West Africa. There are several stories, but the one I subscribe to is that there are two, they sent over 200 boats with families and women and children to explore the other side of the Atlantic. Only one boat turned back because they got into a very strong uh, marine uh, flow of water and they turned back because they got scared. Well, none of those boats came back and Abu Bakr thought he was breaking a promise with his God and he then outfitted another expedition which came out to this part of the world in uh, 1311. Leaving St. Vincent, we set sail on a northerly course to St. Lucia. Sagas of the open sea are replete with epic tales of heroic exploits. Many of these stories are the embellished accounts of sailors, such as the deeds of Simbad in the Thousand and One Nights. Yet some contain a grain of truth. Leif, the son of the Viking, Eric the Red, really did set foot on Newfoundland in 992. So who can say with certainty that Abu Bakr did not reach the West Indies 200 years before Columbus? This is the break, you know. When I release this, means let go, the anchor will fall down in the water, you know. So when it is deep in a seabed, I have to close the break, you know, and uh, take the little bit tension on the chain. If uh, wind is too much and uh, sea is too rough, that time we use the two anchors. it became obvious to us during the voyage that the old-style traditional sailing boats had all but disappeared from the coastal waters. 
the drive for efficiency and profitability have replaced imagination. Yet, on the contrary, moored here in this little cove of Mary Go Bay, there is a flotilla of boats being tossed every which way, an indication that tourism can open new avenues of commerce, sometimes in surprising ways. The sculptor of dried coconuts is simply a craftsman who works with raw materials that are abundant and free. Yeah, that's my main job. That's enough to live? Yeah. That's, that's the way I'm making my money from the cruise ship coming. That's how I make my living. A good location is fundamental to business success, so our friendly sculptor has set up shop near the Marigo Bay Ferry Landing. Lots of people like the ferry, especially going back and forth, you know, they find it's fun. I do a lot of transporting people all, all day long. It's a 24-hour service. And this is the only one ferry? Yeah. This is the only one ferry, 24-hour service. What can I do if I want to go from a, a side to another one? Okay, well, you'll have to do some swimming, I guess. <laughs> That's why they put the ferry at 24-hour service. There is no road to get across. People come in from the cruise ship, that's when we get the most business, you know. Maybe sometimes in a day we cross like 400 passengers. Yeah, yeah and this ferry, it only holds um, 30 persons at one time. Yeah, and I think it's great, man. The 30 second crossing is only a dollar, not a bad deal. Tourism is very important for this island right now because tourism becomes like one of our main industry right now for the island because if not tourism or the banana crop then the island is the economy is very low you know on the island right now we do really appreciate tourism my 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 wish for the island is to see that um the people, you know, get motivated in the right way and, you know, having the love and, you know, see the island prosper, you know, see everybody have equal opportunity and, you know. Are, are you afraid to see more and more tourism coming here? Well, my brother, it's, it's nothing like being afraid. It's the reality that tourism, you know, have to integrate on the island and tourism white black indian whatever it's an open world you know you know you just want to be where your heart is so it's no problem with me and you know i hope if there's a lot of people who would feel like me then the world would be a better place man Musing over this profession of faith that views tourism as a way of doing business while loving one's neighbor we bid farewell to this tropical paradise and once again board the Royal Clipper.
dispersed West Indies islands creates a myriad of independent states. This makes traveling between the islands difficult. Apart from the yachts and cruisers reserved for tourists, there's still the odd passenger boat that guarantees transportation for the local people. And so, about the same time that the Royal Clipper is setting a northern course to Martinique, passengers are gathering on the wharves at Fort de France. The ferry, L'Express des Îles, is preparing to board. The boat, L'Express des Îles, shuttles back and forth five days a week from the south of Martinique to Saint Lucia and also from northern Martinique to Dominica. From Guadeloupe, there is a daily connection between Fort de France and Pointe à Pitre from December 1st through January 31st. We were the first to offer regular passenger service between these islands. There used to be other boats sailing between southern Guadeloupe, Martinique and Saint Lucia and perhaps between Grand Rivière and Dominica, but these trips were not frequent. About 70% of our customers are locals, mainly families on vacation. Primarily, they choose this mean of transportation because of the price. It's half the cost of flying. Plus, it's obvious to me there is a certain friendly atmosphere amongst the passengers that just doesn't exist on planes. Tourism is now the number one industry in the Caribbean. Martinique has built a new cruise terminal to attract even more visitors to its port. Now, facing the inevitable changes that the tourist industry brings with it, how long will the old cultural roots and traditions persist? In the village of Le Diamant, on the south side of Martinique, the traditional Gomier boat race is one of the highlights of the annual festival. Today's small sailboats average about 33 feet, but they can be as long as 35 feet. When I began racing, these boats were only about 23 feet long. Today the bigger boats require a crew of about nine men, and we only carried a crew of five or six. I started racing when I was very young. Oh, those were the days. It was so exciting. A good 24 sailboats competed. It's different today. You don't see nearly as many. The beach is known to have a powerful undertow and sometimes the contestants don't even make it over the first wave. A part of old Caribbean culture, gommier boats were fashioned after the canoes that the American Indians used to get from Amazonia to the West Indies. Originally, these gommiers were hollowed out of a gum tree trunk with a hatchet, hence their name. It's a long race. The participants must complete a triangular course marked by three buoys. The supporters have time to argue their favorite team's chances. Yeah. <laughs> 
Each boat has its loyal followers. They shout at each other during the race, yelling louder and louder. Ah, it's great fun. A gomye is difficult to maneuver. To keep the boat balanced, the crew members stretch themselves out on long wooden poles, and only their agility prevents the boat from capsizing. At one time, the gummy was used for fishing. Today, it's used only for racing. I used to race in boats, boats made from the hollowed out gum tree. After the race, we would take the boats out to do some fishing. Nowadays, we only use the boats for racing. When they aren't racing, they're stored in a garage. Bellefontaine is one of many fishing villages along the coast between Fort-de-France and Saint-Pierre, the former capital. In the past, all along this shore, protected from the raging sea, the fishermen used a very particular net. Today, this practice has almost disappeared, but a few residents of Bellefontaine have formed an association to preserve one of the last of the island's rituals. In the past, the huge net was cast from a rowboat. But times have changed. Lucien's old gommier is now being pulled along. There, the net's been thrown. Now we motor along. This particular practice is popular in the Caribbean, especially in the villages of Chalcher, Caspilote, Bellefontaine, Le Carbet, Le Saint-Pierre and Le Prachat. Once unfurled, the net, which is several hundred yards long, seals off the entrance to the channel, imprisoning the fish found there. Now it's up to the men and women on shore to raise the heavy net. This kind of net fishing is a collective task in the broadest sense of the word. Teamwork, courage, and mutual respect. These are important to me. You need a crew of at least 10, depending on the size of the net. The net is equipped with floats and uses sinkers for ballast. As the net is very long, wide and heavy, we need all hands to help pull in the net. In the past, the entire village participated. And for their hard work, they shared the catch. Even the poorest members of the community were well fed. Today, tourists willingly participate side by side with the natives, a friendly gesture to help preserve the tradition. If there's no teamwork, there's no fishing. Look at this, hardly two pounds of fish, not even two pounds. Like I say, some days we don't catch a thing, and sometimes we can feel two canoes as big as that one. Some days we're just unlucky. That's how it is in Martinique.
Located near Saint-Pierre, the former capital of Martinique that was destroyed in 1902 when Mount Pelé erupted, we find another fishing village, Le Carbé. To augment the meager income from fishing, a new tourist-related activity has begun. Whatever the reason, the event that Marcel and his friends experienced on Carbet Beach was certainly an interesting one. The Cabin du Pêcheur started about five years ago. One day some tourists walked by and asked me where they could eat fresh fish. I just returned from fishing, so I told them if they wanted to wait a couple of minutes, I would cook them some fresh fish myself. The spirit of the cabin du pêcheur is that the fishermen are able to sell their catch of the day. It gives the tourists the true flavor of Martinique, the people, the warm welcome, the ways of the country, everything. This morning, you saw the fishermen coming to the hut. They bring fresh fish. We fillet them, and they become the fresh catch of the day in the Cabin de Pêcheur restaurant. And it is eaten that very day. Grand Riviere is a coastal village that is truly in the middle of nowhere. It's nestled at the foot of a steep cliff, and its shore is beaten by turbulent seas. Due to its hostile environment, the fishermen from Grand Riviere are considered the most courageous sailors in Martinique. My earliest memories are of my father, the fisherman, and when he returned home from fishing. The sea wasn't like it is today. It was much, much rougher. Class would finish at four o'clock, and I would go down to the port and watch the boats come in. Sometimes there were so many waves, I'd ask the boats to sink so I could dive into the water and gather up all the flying fish. There used to be many, many boats then, as many as a hundred boats. We used to use sailing boats, but we would just drift. Dragging a fishing net. In those days, we used to buy traditional boats, boats from Dominica and Santa Lucia, or sometimes the English would come to sell the boats, and we would buy the boats from them. Was it a good boat? It sure was. It wasn't made of planks, but was dug out of the trunk of a gum tree. They would find a good tree and then hollow it out. At sea, it didn't take on a lot of water. Who chooses the colors you paint the boats? We do. We choose the color. For example, if this year we paint the boats uh, blue and pink, and we come up with nothing, absolutely nothing, then we paint over the color. We change the color to make it a lucky boat. 